On Developer Voices this week, we're exploring the ever thorny problem of SQL, or SQL. How you pronounce it is the minor problem. The big problem is how do you use it from different programming languages? How do you bridge that gap between your favorite language and SQL, which is the de facto language of databases? We've seen a lot of different approaches to this problem over the years, from the basic of munging SQL strings together by hand, really error prone, kind of a security risk, I wouldn't recommend it, to very abstract approaches like Hibernate or Active Record that as far as possible, try and shield you from knowing that the database even exists, which is great for the simple stuff. In my experience, it breaks down pretty quickly as soon as you want to do anything really sophisticated. Honestly, I've never been happy, genuinely happy, crossing that object relational bridge. So when I heard about a new library that's making a few waves, I thought we should get the author in and he can break down what his solution is. So my guest today is Lucas Eder. He's written a library called Juke, that's J-O-O-Q. And it's firmly of the opinion that SQL is the right tool for dealing with data and databases. And what you should do is adapt the programming language to fit it really, really well. Juke's a JVM library, so you could use it today in Java, Scala, Kotlin. But more generally, I think his approach is also ripe for taking inspiration from and porting to other statically typed languages. So let's dig in and break it down. Maybe you'll learn a new and less painful way to talk to your database. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Lucas Eder. I'm joined today by database programming guru, Lucas Eder. Can I call you that? Yes, sure. <laughs> Lucas, how I'm are you? Lucas? Yeah, I'm Lucas. Hi, I'm great. How are you, Chris? I'm very well, very well. Looking forward to chewing over one of... I don't, I don't want to say it's the biggest topic in our industry, but it's certainly a topic that just about bothers every programmer at some point. And that's the mismatch between objects in their programming language and the database they're trying to store things in, which is mm-hmm. one you've wrestled with actively. So, 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 so have I. So as most programmers, but you think you've tri- you've solved it, right? Well, I I'd say I'd, I've solved it by circumventing it in in the sense that uh, I just don't believe in the object oriented paradigm at the client <laughs> side as a representation of the model in the database. The database model is superior, in my opinion, so that kind of makes okay. things easier. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're, I know you're a Java programmer. You are rejecting the Java yeah. notion that everything is an object. Yeah. So actually, even Java starts rejecting that uh, notion uh, since recently, since uh, they've started adding more data-oriented uh, data structures like records, and then now there are really abstract data types uh, pretty soon, so um, I think this kind of paradigm that is very uh, familiar to SQL developers will will uh, be more popular in the near future. So this object-oriented thing, where you have object with identities and you have graphs of object that are uh, related to each other, like in an ORM, is one side of the coin. You can obviously model your stuff like that, and it makes sense for some use cases. But for other use cases, which are more data-oriented. Um, the SQL version of uh, the representation of data, the relational one, might make more sense. And in my uh, solution, which is Duke, I've never tried to uh, bridge between the two worlds. It just ignores the object-oriented one, and uh, <laughs> you kind of stream the tuples directly from the database, and you still treat them as tuples in, in the client. So there's there's this dichotomy in programming. Some people treat like treat Java as the center of their world. Mm. and Postgres as fancy storage. Right. And some people treat Postgres as the center of their world and Java as fancy processing. You could see it like that, yeah. And you're very much in the the programming language as fancy programming for tuples side of the fence. It's just how I feel about it. I don't impose this way of thinking on anyone. I mean, if if you don't think like that, like uh, the SQL-centric way, then uh, maybe Juke wouldn't be the right solution for you anyway. So... 
I'm not trying to convince anyone to change their way of thought, but if someone thinks already the way I do, or I think you as well, you did something similar in Clojure, which is also very data-oriented, of course. Yeah. Um, then people already think this way, and then they will look for a solution like the one I've, I'm providing. Okay, so you're not you're not trying to change people's mental model. You're just providing the tool if they are already in that space. Yeah, it's a lot of work to change people, and and often it's not <laughs> even the right way. I mean, it's my my way of thinking, and they have good reasons to think differently. So, so I'm I'm not trying to convince anyone of that. No, yeah. I'm kind of of the opinion that if all you're doing is storing objects by ID and pulling those same objects back out by ID, probably this. Let's characterize it as the hibernate way of doing things, where we're very much just trying to pretend the database doesn't exist. No, not necessarily. I mean, IDs are very uh, ubiquitous also in the relational model, right? So every table has a primary key if you're in the first normal form. Mm. And uh, you probably are, right? So you're normalizing your database schema. So you have those IDs. And it makes sense to think of the records as well, not just the data sets. So... um, the way I usually compare ORMs and, and SQL, th- that br- that gap that you've mentioned, is uh, it's basically just an inversion of arrows. So in the relational world, the child points to the parent, whereas in the object-oriented world, the parent points to the child okay. much more often, right? So the parent contains the child, uh, which might still point back to the parent, but the main, main thing is you have a book with authors. So you have a list of authors in the book, and that's how you think about it. Uh, also, in a graph database, you do it this way. And in the relation model, it's always the opposite. It's always the other way around. So the the, the author, in this case, would point to a book with via a uh, relationship table. Mm. Do you think that's what makes all this hard, then, the way relationships are modeled? Not necessarily. I think... If if you if you think about it thoroughly, then it's just really this inversion of arrows, right? So the the, the most of most of the gap that uh, has been experienced in the past is that SQL as a language makes it kind of hard to serialize this data in one or the other format. So if you serialize your data with SQL, uh, in the classic sense, SQL 92 didn't have many constructs to nest data structures. So uh, you would have probably used joins to denormalize your data, and then you have duplicates, which you have deduplicate again in the client. And you need you kind of need an ORM to do all, all this uh, boring uh, mapping work. Mm. So in the end, you have the same representation of the data in the database and in the client, just inversion of arrows, but the rest is the same, right? So you, if you're using, for instance, JPA, then you will also use a relational model of your data. You will no, use the same concepts, the same uh, kind of annotations, like many-to-many, many-to-one, one-to-many, or whatever. So you have the same way of thinking as the relational one. You're just inverting those arrows, and then you let JPA do the the... <clears throat> the serialization, which is the hard work, right? So the problem is that SQL itself, the old part, the old uh, standard, didn't uh, embrace nesting of data structures, so you had mm. to do this manually somehow with lots of tricks. But uh, in more more recent versions, uh, you can actually do all of this in SQL as well. Okay, so take me through what Duke. It's J O O K J O O Q, and you're pronouncing right. it Duke, right. right? Okay, take me through how that actually plays out as a solution? What does it look like as a programmer? So uh, Juke is an internal domain-specific language which models the SQL language directly as a Java API. So you can write SQL in Java. It looks like Java code, but it also looks like SQL code at the same time. And the Java compiler will type check your SQL statements directly while you write it. So first off, this makes uh, for uh, syntax correctness in, in terms of the SQL language. But there's also a source code generator that reverse engineers your database schema, which means that you have all your tables and your columns directly as Java objects with type information associated with them. So you can always have a type safe access to your database model as well. That's pretty much it. So it's a a SQL builder uh, with a lot of type safety embedded in the Java language, or also Kotlin and Scala, of course. Uh, Okay. It works nicely as well there. Do you have you have three versions of it for the three different? No, it's right. it's one API with some extensions for the two other languages. So it's basically right. written in Java, and there's some extensions for Kotlin and some for Scala, where it makes sense. Okay, so the code generator. If so, you're saying I don't come to this from Java land. I probably got a schema already set up in the database, yes. and it's just yes. going to generate from that. 
So that's uh, at the core of Juke is the idea that you have your database already. You are a database-centric developer, probably. Uh, yeah. It still works if you're not, but if you are, then Juke is perfect for you because no matter what the schema is, how many tables, you can have hundreds and thousands of tables and views and store procedures or whatever, and Juke can do something with those and generate code for them so you can access those objects. And and you're probably going to have a schema that survives your client application, or you may have multiple client applications, maybe a Python script that accesses the same SQL database uh, from a different endpoint. And the SQL database is always more important than the application accessing it. So this is the mindset yeah. of Duke. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You mm. Nearly always the database will outlive the particular application that talks to it. Yeah. Mm. So... Let's dig into something like you say these uh, nested relationships in SQL, right? If I have, if I have, say, one table that models nested data as an array inside a column, and another table that models it as a relation to another uh, table, how is that going to look by the time I get to Java land? Mm -hmm. Well, on Juke's side, uh, it's a one-to-one -one representation. So if you have a foreign key relationship, then that's a different table for Juke as well. If you have a nested data structure, like an array or a user-defined type, then Juke will notice those things and will nest those things as well in the table where you reference those types. So Juke will just have a one-to-one -one representation of your actual database model. It will okay, never try so to do trying to abstract over on that. your behalf. Okay. Yeah, and then presumably yeah, it's because you you already designed this model and you want to use it the way you designed it, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you're not taking any opinions on how the data should be changed to yeah. fit the world of Java. Yeah. Okay, exactly. I can so see you that. You don't even need primary keys. You don't even need any constraints. You don't need any normal forms. You can do whatever you want and still query your data because you designed this database the way you want it, right? So Juke won't judge you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to not be judged by my programming languages for a change. I feel judged right. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I will judge you, but not you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that raises questions about support, but we'll dodge that. Right. <laughs> um, so if you're largely generating the code, entirely generating the driving code from, um, from the schema of the database, are you doing something like, regenerating it on every release and storing that code in change control so you can see if the scheme has changed in unexpected ways? That's how I would do it personally, but Juke isn't opinionated about this. So uh, there's just a code generator. It's a, it's a standalone uh, Java program, which you can use as a Maven or a Gradle plugin as well if you want. You can make it a part of the, your CI CD pipeline. Uh, I've also documented how to integrate that with test containers, for example. So you could spin up a test containers uh, Postgres instance just for code generation where you migrate your database uh, change changes directly into this in-memory Postgres instance uh, and then run the code generator against it. So you can do it in any way you want. So typically, the ideal usage would be indeed every time you change something to the database, in whatever way you want, you regenerate the code immediately and you, you test everything. You have your integration test suite, uh, which runs on the regenerate the code. So presumably a system like that means you can start to get compile time errors for schema changes. Yes, yes, that's the point, right? So yeah. whenever you change a schema object, like for instance, you change the data type of some, some column or you rename it, or you move stuff around, you want your uh, client code to break because there's a lot of stuff you have to fix. So this way with Juke, you will immediately notice where all the places you have to fix right now. So I think this is superior to, uh, to approaches where you have embedded SQL in string form. So maybe IDEs these days can, uh, can help you with the syntax correctness while you write the SQL, but to validate if it's correct at compile time, you, you probably still have to run the SQL first. With yeah. Juke, you don't have to do that necessarily. I mean, semantically, you still have to check it at runtime, but at least syntactically, you, you can be quite sure that uh, all of these changes will actually affect your code. Yeah, at least you're guaranteed that those column names still exist, that kind yes. of thing. Yes, <laughs> Yeah. You can also search. You can use your ID to search references to columns and stuff like that. So there's a lot of uh, added value to having uh, generated code from your database schema. So you can document your database schema with comments in SQL, 
There's okay. a comment statement in Postgres and other databases. So you will have a Java doc representation of that comment directly on your column, also in Java code, okay. uh, which is really nice. So uh, there's a lot of benefits to this approach. Yeah. If you can persuade the people doing the um, DDL to comment their code, which could be tricky. Yeah. But once you notice this, that this exists, uh, you start using it, right? Yeah. Yeah. That having the tools there to support it is the first step to mm. actually making use of it. Yeah. And so if we get from the code generation side into the actual programming side, I've, I've had a look at Duke's syntax and it is trying to be very much um, Java flavored SQL. So it's a fluid API where you'd say dot select column yes. names dot from. Is that is that hard to make it work? across all the different features of all the different databases? Yeah, there were a couple of caveats that are uh, not easy to solve, obviously, because, for instance, some some uh, SQL keywords are also Java keywords, and you can't use them as method names, Yeah, like if or else or these kind of things, case. So uh, <laughs> the simple solution is just to append an underscore and then be done with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, other things are... Um, some methods are weird because they're already reserved on, on the object API, like wait. There's actually a wait keyword in SQL, and I can't use a wait method because object wait is a thing. So that would oh. have a different semantics. Yeah. Or also equals is a, a method on object, and, and it would be a nice method to use when you compare two things in, in SQL. So it's not equals in, in Juke. So some things are... Uh, they're just little caveats. It's not a. There are no showstoppers, obviously. But, but other than that, um, I think pretty much every SQL language feature can map to this sort of DSL. Uh, pretty in a straightforward way. I've documented this a very long time ago on the Juke blog. How how you can automate this even using an API generator from a BNF notation of your language. So uh, when you have a BNF notation of the language, you have choices or repetitions and stuff like that and that always translates one to one to some some api usage uh in java almost so uh <laughs> sometimes uh i i make a couple of uh, uh compromises like for instance if you have a keyword and then you have a parameter like uh fetch first five rows only which mm. is a sql syntax it would be a bit weird to have to write rows only as well in java so it's it's just limit five so this is the MySQL or Postgres old syntax. Right. Uh, it's kind of easier this way than having to use superfluous keywords in a Java API. So sometimes yeah. there's a compromise to be made. But in, in most cases, if you think in terms of SQL, you have the SQL syntax in your head, uh, you want to write it exactly the same way in Juke. So this is the, the main uh, philosophy behind the API design. So there's no new invention of something that exists in SQL and in Juke, it's called entirely differently for no reason. Right. Because yeah. that would be cognitive friction. You would have to think about this and learn the API in, in a much harder way than it already is. So it's, it's not hard to learn because once you know the SQL syntax, you, you know, okay, it's got to be like, the, like this in Juke as well. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and again, you're going for this like path of least friction, like what yes. people already know and believe is the right way to do it. Just make that possible. Yeah, I think this is a wise choice to make. Otherwise, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, similar libraries in other languages like Slick and Scala, or there's Duby as well, I think. And uh, in other languages, uh, in Kotlin, there's Exposed, and they all invented new uh, DSL uh, constructs. So Exposed, for, in for instance, I think they use Slice, and I don't even know what Slice means. Slice is something Kotlin-specific. When I hear Slice, I would think, it's a, connect, a collection, and you want to slice it into pieces, but I have no uh, mental model what this would mean in SQL. Yeah. And at the, the other way around, if I want to write a SQL statement and have a where clause, is, is where slice or is where something else? I wouldn't know, so I would always have to think about it. So if you're an experienced, exposed user, obviously you will learn this language, but if, if you're the new person on the team and, and you have to read this code, Maybe it's it's much harder for that uh, for that person to to understand what's going on, and I really wanted to focus on 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 not having this friction at all. So uh, a SQL developer will immediately see okay, where is where, and having is having, and group by is group by. Yeah, there's really yeah. no no uh, surprise here. That raises a big juicy question about learn whether developers should learn SQL. But I just have one more thing about yes. your mapping first, which I want to check. Right. So one problem I've had with, I've seen libraries that do something like this before, 
where they're trying to translate SQL into um, a native um, programming language API. Some of them say, okay, so I'll just support the standard. And then the particular feature that you like in your particular database Mm -hmm. isn't there. Some say, okay, Postgres is the best one, so we'll support the standard plus everything in Postgres. What do you do for the things that are kind of specific to specific databases? So in general, the standard should be the thing that Juke uh, decides on. So if a feature is in the standard, then Juke will try to use that syntax, uh, assuming that some implementations also implemented it, of course. So if it's a very esoteric standard, then maybe it's not a priority. But a lot of times, the standard feature is the one that everyone else will converge to eventually, maybe in 20 years or so. It takes a long time, but you can assume that uh, eventually database implementations will, will implement the standard. Like... As I said before, uh, Postgres already had limit, and then uh, I think SQL 2008 introduced the standard fetch syntax, which was already available in DB2, and then Oracle implemented it. And usually, once DB2 and or Oracle implement something, they put it in the standard because they're very <laughs> generous with us and uh, invent all these things that they uh, make available to all the implementations. So um, now Postgres adopted the standard as well. You can still write limit, but I think they even switched now the default in the in the documentation what they recommend you use. So you start using fetch first instead of a limit. Uh, also because fetch has uh, more 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 features, right? So you can have uh, the with ties clause, uh, which is not very well known, but uh, it can be occasionally useful when you have uh, ten rows. You want to fetch ten rows, but if the tenth and eleventh rows are tied, you get both. So you can do that with the uh, fetch okay. clause. You can't do that with the limit clause. Tied and, in the uh, sense that you your order by could have yes yes your order right. by okay. is not uh, deterministic so you have two ties in the ordering so you want to have uh, both yeah I didn't know about that one that's a handy yeah thing. yeah that's great <laughs> and the standard also has percent you can have fetch the first ten percent of your rows which is also occasionally useful I think Postgres didn't implement it yet but they will eventually and it won't be available in the old syntax it will only mm. be available in the standard syntax but so, what if sorry yeah. Karen. Yeah, so that that would be the default. Uh, but but on the other hand, there are a lot of uh, vendor specific features which are really interesting as well. Uh, people love to use them. So um, the standard, for instance, would be to use merge. Postgres had didn't have merge for a very long time. I think fifteen introduced it finally. Mm. Uh, they in, they invented their own syntax. One of the few times that Postgres invented something on their own rather than following with the standard, mm. which is a bit weird in my opinion. So they inserted in, the insert is they invented insert on conflict, which is probably more useful most of the time, but it's it's less powerful and lacks features that merge has. And now they invented. Uh, they implemented merge as well. So what to do in Juke? So Juke obviously had to uh, support on conflict as well. So uh, Juke users could uh, use this powerful feature for upserting. Juke already had MySQL's insert on duplicate key update, which is almost the same thing, but subtly different. Uh, so Juke now has all three, right? So uh, right. on duplicate key update from MySQL, which is the simplest one, but the, the least powerful one. And then on conflict, which is more powerful, and then merge, which is the most powerful. Okay. But say I I have picked a relational database that you've never heard of, and it yeah. follows the standard, and but they have one extra feature that you've never heard of, and I'd like to use that. Can I use Duke? Because it's yeah, mostly probably, standard. Yeah. Can I add this feature myself without begging you as a pull request? I got a lot of support requests from people who use Duke with some arbitrary database that I've never heard of. And mm. they were successful because, I mean, there's some st- some dialects are very standards compliant. I wouldn't say Postgres. Postgres has a lot of uh, Postgres specifics. For instance, the, the cast syntax was different for a long time in Juke, or maybe uh, some data types which are different. But for instance, uh, I don't know if you know about hypersonic HSQLDB, um, predecessor no. of H2. Okay. Uh, it's very standards compliant, uh, H2 as well. So so those people usually have been quite successful using the those two dialects and, and pointing it to a, some entirely different database, which is kind of standards compliant. Of course, they will always run into regressions eventually. So hmm. it's it's not necessarily a good idea to, to go all in on this integration because, for instance, if H2 or HSQLDB adds a new feature, which is 
a better feature than what they had before. Juke will support that and maybe change the default rendering of some, some implementation, right? So you, you relied on, on an emulation of some feature, hmm. which wasn't optimal. And now Juke can make it more optimal for the target database product. But your database product, which is a different one, doesn't support this. So you will get a regression at runtime. So it's not supported, but you could get it to run. So, is there anything I can do to extend it? Like, uh, can I, in my own code base, teach Duke yeah. new syntaxes? So, um, if you're doing function calls or stuff like that, like if you have vendor specific functions that are not supported, that's very easy. You can build a small library. There's always a plain SQL templating feature that you can use. So, you can use uh, string templates uh, where you can compose strings based on strings and nest them arbitrarily. Uh, kind of like uh, in MyBatis, uh, which is the oh, XML-based yeah. uh, library, where you can also use XML files and nest them arbitrarily to create templates. And you can do that with Duke as well. And extend the DSL in any way you want. This works for uh, simple expressions, but once you want to have something like a select clause, it's more complicated because you, you can't easily put that inside of Juke. Juke wouldn't know what where to place your clause. But you can patch. I mean, you can you can patch the gener generated SQL with uh, regular expressions if you want. So um, <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there it's are, a last resort. Yeah, it's a last resort, but uh, <laughs> it works well. I mean, if you know, it's always something that happens right before the where clause. Uh, you just look where is the where clause and replace. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what could I mean, you're be using wrong? a database product that's not supported. So uh, I guess you're you're open to this kind of a solution if if Duke still adds value. Okay, that raises the question, which databases do you actively support? Yeah, there are about 30 of them, so um, I'm not going to list really? them all here. So all the big ones plus a lot of smaller ones. So uh, Juke has been uh, immensely popular in the in recent years, with, uh, especially with those number crunching database products, where it makes a lot of sense. So I think if you have a number crunching database, uh, like BigQuery or Redshift or Snowflake, mm. you're not going to use an ORM anyway. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. You're not storing transactional data. You're querying it for analytics. So your queries are super complex. You have uh, tons of dynamic SQL as well, which is, uh, which is where Juke really shines. So if your SQL is dynamic, you can compose arbitrary SQL fragments very easily. So uh, with those database products, Juke makes a lot of sense. So... And, and inventors have been adding adding new new dialects all the time. So um, uh, they all compete in terms of performance, obviously, but also in terms of syntax, unfortunately, for, for users, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so you're not just supporting relational databases, like anything with a standard-ish SQL interface? Well, it really has to be SQL. I mean, some products claim they now also support SQL, like MongoDB or... Uh, uh, What's it called again? Uh, Elastic. I mean, they, they, they have select from and where maybe, and, and they call <laughs> that SQL. It's, it doesn't make sense to use Juke with that. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, I mean, what is a relational database product? In the end, if it lacks primary key, can it still be relational? In my opinion, yes, it could be. I mean, you can still store your, your data in terms of SQL tables and columns and, and these kind of standard data structures. Mm. So once they actually embrace the SQL language and the SQL standard, then yes, yes, Juke can support that. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so maybe we should go back to that honking great topic which you hinted at, which is, do you think that programmers should know SQL? I mean, should, should you expect programmers these days to learn that kind of way of thinking and come into a new project knowing it? Absolutely. I mean, I have an entire talk about it on YouTube, um, which has about 50,000 views, views by now. It's been <laughs> a really popular talk, uh, which I've given at Vox Zurich, I think. And uh, the talk is about um, getting the most out of your relational database. Uh, you can do it two ways, right? Either you do it uh, in, a, in a Java way, and I kind of make fun of the Java developer approach, which uh, is creating <laughs> POJOs and creating getters and setters and writing equals and hash code and writing abstractions like factories and factory builders and stuff like that. And they have so much infrastructure and not even a single line of business logic. <laughs> and uh, it's really it's really hard to change the system very easily. Uh, you have to change so many components to have a new business requirement. Whereas in SQL, you just describe the requirement and you have your results and you're done, right? So that's kind of <laughs> exaggerated, of course. 
But um, SQL is a wonderful language for, for uh, a lot of things. So once you have uh, a query, something that can be expressed as a query, and a lot of requirements are queries, right? How much did we earn in this, uh, in this year? How much did we earn per store in this year? Whatever. These kind of things, you shouldn't calculate them by hand because you're, you'll be always doing low-level stuff like putting stuff in a hash map, putting stuff in a list, sorting lists, and extracting stuff. And eventually, your, stuff, your code is slow. You have N plus 1 problems, irrespective if you're using ORMs or if you're writing handwriting SQL. Mm. If, you're, if you're not thinking in terms of data sets, then you will run in tons of uh, performance problems, but not just performance problems. You're also performing yourself very slowly because in SQL, you can just change a little bit of the, of the syntax and you have an entirely different query very fast and it's going to be correct. Because all the, the algorithms behind the scenes to fetch the data and materialize it and put it in the form that you want are certainly correct, right? So yeah. the only thing that could be wrong is the requirement itself or your way to translate it into a formal language. But um, I'm always surprised about developers who think SQL is something old or wrong. It's, I mean, the syntax reminds of COBOL, and that may be the only criticism that I <laughs> think is valid. But if someone is uh, data oriented, uh, they're they're going to use for comprehension in any language. And what is a for comprehension, right? So if you use the mathematical notation with the curly braces, you have the curly braces, which is the data set, and then you have for all x, which is the from clause, and then you have the pipe, and then the where clause. It's the yeah. same thing. It's always the same thing. I mean, this way of thinking of SQL is no different from any other mathematical way of thinking about data. It's just a c- kind of weird and quirky syntax, but that's it. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful paradigm, and uh, I think people should embrace it for, for the purposes where it makes sense. Yeah. Personally, yeah. I also like XSLT, for instance, which XSLT. is also <laughs> <laughs> apparently a controversial a opinion, but <laughs> I mean, the syntax is also the problem there. You have a lot of uh, opening and closing uh, brackets and, and uh, tags, but, but the, the programming model is wonderful. You have a stream of, of elements that goes through your processor and you transform it in a functional way with this wonderful X query language or, or just X path. You pattern match your XML document and your output is a new XML document. So you really have to hate XML itself for weird reasons to not like XSLT. But other, <laughs> other than that, it's, it's, it's a wonderful paradigm. Really, it's, it's, I, I don't understand why it's uh, not, not more popular anymore. I mean, okay. Somehow people think JSON is better, but uh, JSON has to reinvent everything XML had because people actually wanted that stuff, like JSON schema, JSON processing. Now we have JSON path. It's all the same thing. It's just XML yeah. had it from the start. Yeah, yeah. It's. Um, I wonder why. It can't just be syntax. Actually, it could just be syntax, knowing the programming world. No, it was over-engineered. I mean, all the name sta- namespacing stuff, I don't think I've ever needed that, right? So you can have nested namespaces and declare everything in XSD files, and you would have tons of errors, and it would take forever to get it right. And SOAP was so over-engineered, mm. right? So to just have a single endpoint on, on, the, on the internet somewhere, you had to declare this huge, huge, huge WSDL file, and, and it took forever but to, to understand what you had to do. But... Uh, other than that, the core of XML hasn't didn't really have a problem, in my opinion. Mm. Except I could never figure out whether something should be an attribute or a nested element. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the attributes. Uh, yeah, I guess that was a mistake. The, the attributes the, they came from the document oriented uh, uh, usage of XML. So you had those two basic usages, right? Yeah, document oriented and data oriented, and probably didn't need uh, attributes in the data oriented one. Mm, yeah. So let's talk a bit about data-oriented yeah. programming. Yeah. Because that seems to be the unifying idea here that Absolutely. brings in SQL and um, data processing generally and functional programming. And mm-hmm. do you think that is back on the rise? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, it's everything is going up and down all the time, like a server and client side computation, right? So we did we used to have mainframes and then we did everything in, in, in servlets and back to the server and back to the client. And it's the <laughs> same thing with with imperative or object oriented, which to me are the same thing, and functional programming. So either you have state and you want to manipulate state and that has its purpose for instance if you have a rich client ui you want to have that you have a window which is kind of an object and you want to send messages to it and manipulate its internal state 
Whereas when you have data, you kind of think of a stream of a flow of stuff that goes through a processor and the processor doesn't change the input. It just generates output. And it's both are wonderful paradigms. And for some reasons, developers always think it must be either or. They create these false uh, dichotomies, which don't need, really have to exist. Both things have their purpose, right? So I wouldn't implement the UI entirely functionally. I, I can't imagine it. Probably people do it, but uh, I, I kind of find it hard to reason about a rich client, like a Windows application with, uh, with Windows in an entirely functional way probably could be elegant, but I think object-oriented oriented program is better suited there. Okay, I could grind my own axe on that one and try and convince what? you. I could grind yeah. an axe and yeah, I could try and convince you that actually the functional way is really elegant in the front end. Could be, yeah. But, well, but I, that's I did it as podcast. well with XSLT in the past, so uh, <laughs> it, it generated uh, uh, HTML in the end, so and it was a complete stateless uh, request-response model. We should do a pair programming video where we thrash <laughs> this one out. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think they are slightly I mean, we love a we love a holy war in programming from the days of editors all the way up to how you actually implement problems. But I yeah. do think there is a difficult to reconcile difference between imperative or object oriented programming and um data oriented functional programming. And the biggest one is Mutation and what, how you deal with statefulness. Mm. They just seem to have such different ideas of how that works that you, I think you have to choose one or the other. Is that fair? In, in theory, you shouldn't have to choose, but practically, obviously, you have to, right? So I always say uh, to people who object that SQL is kind of stateful, I tell them, actually, it isn't. So if you have a perfect database product, which is mm. entirely perfect and doesn't actually destroy any state with your update or delete statement. In theory, you have a database and you all you have an append-only database and your update is also an append operation. You create a new record that obsoletes an existing old record and you don't mutate the actual record. You just append stuff. So you could, you could design a SQL database in an entirely um, side-effect-free way, mm. in theory. So... I don't think anyone actually implemented this because uh, ultimately you have to remove data again to to uh, to uh, avoid uh, a huge data pile that you can't manage anymore, right? So if you never delete anything in a large system, that might not work. But the SQL standard has a, a version and and a, a bitemporal features where you can actually uh, tell the SQL engine to not actually update the record, but to split it in two and, and mark the old one as deleted, but it's still there. And yeah. uh, and that would that would be very, very nice, right? So uh, yeah. I think in the in the closure world, which you're uh, more familiar with, I guess, um, the Atomic works this way, more or yes, less. You yeah. have an append-only database, and uh, it feels like you update stuff, but you're actually not updating it. You're, you're changing, you're adding to it. And the result is a new database, so you, the input is a database and the output is a database, and it doesn't modify anything. So I think this elegant world can exist, and you can interact with it in an imperative style, but it's not actually mutating stuff. So I think yeah. imperative languages in principle could be made entirely functional in, in that sense, I guess. Yeah, because we, we have that in the programming world. Like when you, it looks like you're mutating. Um, an immutable data structure, but really you're creating a new one. Mm -hmm. becomes, and the past doesn't disappear. We yeah. actually had um, James Henderson on this podcast a few weeks ago about talking about XTDB, which is another attempt like Datomic to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. Are you ever tempted to go beyond the, uh, the interface library and build your own database? No. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a life next to my job. <laughs> I don't think that it would be very easy. It would be very challenging and fun to do, but uh, I mean, Juke is already enough work. Yeah. And I have a lot of plans with Juke itself. So uh, I think I'll let the database stuff to the to those experts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a very, very deep rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> Much deeper, I guess. Yeah. So what are your plans for Juke? Um, one of the features that I've been working on in the pa in the recent past has been uh, multiset support. Multiset is a standard SQL operator that allows for nesting uh, tuples in a relational way. So you can have 
arrays, multisets, or sets that are nested in, inside of a record. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, OR DBMS were a thing. So there were object databases at the time, which tried oh, yeah. to say, okay, SQL is now over, and we have to do everything object-oriented. <laughs> <laughs> and the SQL databases kind of adopted these features into ORDBMS, like, as I said, arrays and stuff like that. So um, Postgres is one of the implementations. Oracle is another one. And the third one, which is less popular, Informix, have these features. So Juke implements this, and behind the scenes usually generates a SQL JSON uh, because other dialects don't actually support this natively. So you can actually nest stuff uh, in a Juke query as if all those databases support the SQL standard. So this is really powerful. You can then map it to lists or sets in your Java APIs, and everything is type safe. So you have a type safe tree mapper that can map arbitrary levels of depth of uh, arbitrary objects into uh, into Java classes, which is super powerful. So everyone who has tried this will never look back. It's it's <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't get enough buzz, I think, but... Um, once people try this, they they really see the superpower of uh, having types of embedded SQL. Yeah, that that sounds like we're getting to the point where mainstream relational databases might consume the market share they lost to document databases. Yeah, Oracle also did its part for that. So um, they uh, they implemented something really fancy in Oracle twenty three C, which has been released as a developer preview and will be soon GA. Uh, they have this JSON um, relational duality feature where it can declare a JSON tree uh, being backed as your relational tables and you can update the tree and it actually translates to updates to the nested collections. So this is super powerful. They, they kind of did the same thing I did, but in the database, you can declare a view and, and do arbitrary things so, so you, you can even update it. So this, this is something you can do with Juke directly. So I'm going to be looking into that very soon. Uh, and supporting that feature in Juke. So uh, they exposed the nested JSON data structure as a JSON schema. So you can have type safe queries on your nested data structures of your relational uh, model. And I, I guess Juke's code generator will then generate uh, Java classes for those uh, JSON objects. So JSON will just be the serialization format behind the scenes in, in, in that use case. Okay. So you can have, uh, I guess, a REST API and have it completely implemented with uh, Juke. Uh, in between, uh, and then Oracle, so you can manipulate stuff in between. I mean, you could even, uh, uh, Oracle has REST APIs directly into the database, so you wouldn't need middleware. But in case you, you actually need the middleware to uh, do an additional manipulations, uh, Juke will help you there. Okay. So there's a lot of really cool new features coming in all the SQL databases, so I'm hoping Oracle will standardize this particular feature. Uh, once it's standardized, I'm, I'm pretty sure Postgres will, will uh, implement it as well. Um, or there are graph uh, features which have now shipped in the latest SQL standard, which I find very, very exciting. So there's uh, Neo4j has implemented the Cypher query language and invented a lot of cool features there with their yeah. own syntax where you have kind of arrows to declare your graph relationships. Yeah, And that has now been part of the SQL standard as well. I've downloaded and bought the, the standards document from ISO and, and it looks really well done. Oracle already has shipped uh, an implementation as well. So they were uh, big in the team of uh, standardization and implementation. So I've tried it. So it, it kind of really, really makes sense. You can have your relational model. And as I said before, what you're doing is you invert the arrows. Mm. So now uh, the parent points to the children and you can model your query in terms of uh, parent-child relationships like this and, and pattern match your graph across uh, your schema in, in in this way. So I'm not sure about the implementation yet, so I'm not sure if it's fast, but yeah. uh, it, it's an elegant way of thinking, and I'm pretty sure they will make it faster if it's not fast yet. Yeah, I've seen people do it just in like, uh, probably about 10 years ago, I saw people trying to do it in, um, I think it was Postgres. Yeah, yeah, the Postgres and, has a, an extension, I think. Yeah, it was possible. Perhaps. It was kind of slow, and all yeah. the queries were really hairy. The generated ones or the the, uh, the ones you wrote? usually inevitably hand rolled oh, ended yeah, up okay. with yeah um, not to be recommended but if that's being adopted into the standard that might yeah we'll get better eventually yeah is um how do you figure out your development roadmap do you look at what other databases are doing do you look at the do you read the ISO standard and see what features you're going to need to do next or do you just listen to the people who are using it. 
Well, the ISO standard isn't really uh, advancing very fast, so it's not the biggest source of inspiration. So uh, this uh, graph stuff is kind of the biggest change in, in a lot of years uh, I've seen in the standard. Of course, SQL JSON is a big new feature of the standard, but Juke already su supported some of it uh, because Postgres uh, had a lot of vendor-specific API in the past already, so it made sense to support this as well. Um, but yeah, I, I do check out release notes of uh, database products, and if there's something really cool that Juke didn't do yet, for instance, once I supported uh, Teradata, a very old uh, and popular database from the 90s, which is still around in a lot of systems. And they have this qualify um, a clause to the select statement. Qualify is like having, but for window functions, which is really powerful. Okay. So for instance, if you want to have a query where you have the ties, like I said before, and yeah. your database doesn't support it, you can, you can query for the rank of your row ordered by your ordering criteria, and, and you don't have to nest the query to calculate the window function. So Qualify is a vendor-specific extension which has been uh, adopted by, I think, at least Snowflake and uh, I think XSL maybe has it and H2 has it and DuckDB also has it. So okay. I, I see this being adopted by a lot of vendors because it's so obvious to do. It's such a simple feature and it's such an obvious uh, value uh, addition. And I think there are people uh, discussing standardizing it now. I I've met someone... Uh, yeah. Who, who is looking into standardizing it from the Postgres community and um, uh, can't promise anything, can't say if it's happening, but it, it does make sense. So this is a discovery I've immediately implemented in Juke, for instance, once I started supporting Teradata. And Juke can emulate it in any database, right? So you can use now Qualify and any dialect that supports window functions because for Juke, it's just either it's supported natively or Juke just generates a, a derived table, a nested query and, and filters on, on the window function. Okay, nice. Okay, right. so, is, so this, is some, this is a detail I've missed. Sometimes Juke is generating not just the, the direct translation from what you've typed, but actually stepping in and saying, oh, yeah. what you mean in SQL is this. Yes. If, it's okay. really not, there, if there's really no vendor-specific way to do it, then... There's an emulation, okay. like on conflict in the past. So if you write on conflict uh, from Postgres and you you want to start supporting Oracle as well uh, in your application, not just Postgres, then Juke will automatically generate the merge statement for you, okay. which is equivalent to whatever you wrote was on conflict. So you if do need to tell possible. Juke which database you're using. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a That's SQL right. dialect that you pass to Juke. If people want to get, give um, Juke a try, where's the best place to find it? Juke.org. Juke.org, easy. Yes. And just it's just a Java library. Right. So you download it. You, you probably use it with Maven. There are example projects where you can start or a demo project. That There's not much you have to do to set up. All, all you need is a JDBC driver, a database connection, and you can get started. Boom. And uh, Scala and Kotlin too. Yes. Perfect. Absolutely. Okay, well, next time I'm connecting to a SQL database, which shouldn't be too far away, I'll give it a try. Excellent. Lucas, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Cheers. Thank you, Lucas. Do check out Duke. There are a lot of ideas there to use if you're on the JVM, and still some ideas to steal if you're elsewhere. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but if you're Googling for it, it's J-O-O-Q. Also, while we were talking, we hinted at a good way to implement functional user interfaces. If you're interested in that, I think the best place to start is by searching for the Elm architecture. But again, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Maybe we should do an episode on functional user interfaces in the near future. That'd be fun. Uh, if you want to make sure you catch future episodes, now is an excellent time to hit like and subscribe and follow and all those buttons. And you will let me and the algorithms know that you want to hear more. As ever, if you want to get in touch, my contact details are in the show notes for Twitter and LinkedIn and all the usual. And with all that said, I think we're done. Until next time, I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Lucas Eder. Thanks for listening.